Uh, thanks, Richard, for um, passing over the ring. Uh, and I've got about a 50 minute presentation to share with you this evening. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I only jest and what, what I'll do is, is just really spend 10 minutes maybe providing some provocative questions for us to engage. And I, I think what's most interesting, I hope about this evening, uh, is what will come out from the discussion. And it is a little bit like this evening be, being invited to the halls of Valhalla with so many of my heroes sitting out here, David and Peter and Margaret and Christian and Eric, many of you whose work has really helped us over the last two decades to begin to take forward our field, begin to shape it and understand what is this construct that we're exploring and beginning to break that down into its individual components and think about how those elements go together to create the impact. I, as the third speaker this evening, sort of anticipated that Eric would probably focus on those individual processes and those critical moments and the fabulous work he's done really over the last decade of war. Uh, and I imagined that Ellen would give us a critical literature review. And then she's also added to that why the fabulous work that's ongoing at Case Western um, with all of your PhD students. Uh, and really, I wanted to throw in probably five topics for us to think about, maybe taking on the research over the next three to five years of issues that I think the field needs to be considering. And I think the first of those is around the existential crisis and what role in particular coaching has to play in the existential crisis that we face as humanity. We have COP26 approaching us. There is much debate. You cannot pick up uh, a, a broadsheet newspaper or The Economist or any informed source without thinking about the environmental issues that are ongoing and are troubling all of us uh, as countries and as individual citizens. And thinking about what we're doing in coaching, there are a few who are starting to talk about this. We at Henley Business School have started to explore some of these things. Um, but there are fundamental questions here. And I guess for us, when people look back on this conversation in the archive, when they think about the work that we as researchers were doing during the 2020s, they might be asking, what were coaches doing when the planet was burning? And maybe the answer that we have been focused on, well, actually coaches were just simply helping their clients to make the flyer glow hotter. We're focusing on amplifying organizational individual performance. Well, those might be important issues, but there are meta issues beyond those. And I wonder as one of our research questions, that I think our field should begin to start to think about, and I don't have answers, I just have a question, is how we can, as a field, begin to think about what it would look like for coaches to begin to operate, operationalize uh, environmental questions in their coaching conversations uh, with individual clients, with teams, with organizations, and with the wider system. So I think that's the first issue for us to be thinking about. The second one I want to pay some attention to is around race. And once again, this has been a theme, certainly been drawn maybe to many of our attentions more in the immediate past two years with the emergence of Black Lives Matter. Um, many of the street protests certainly we've seen in the United Kingdom and also in the United States and probably in many other countries too. Uh, and for me, that question then comes down to thinking about how we start to think about some of the challenges those rest questions raise for us. At Henley, we have done a number of studies around this, yet unpublished, so we're working to write up those papers to are currently in for review. And the evidence is telling us that the perception for engaging with Indigenous and Black coaches is a perception of inequality. The evidence is also telling us the black coaches in certain major economies are statistically underrepresented. Why is this the case? It's also telling us, which was most worrying, that black and mixed race coaches were paid less 
than white coaches. And maybe none of those are statistics are fascinating to you. Maybe they're not challenging to you. But I think if we are concerned with issues around uh, equality and considering major questions, not only do we need to look at the micro issues, but we also need to look at those macro issues. And a second of these macro issues is about how coaching can take positive action to address equality in our society. And one aspect of that equality is in terms of race. The third theme that I wanted to talk about uh, is around cross-culturalism. And I guess this, this troubles me partly because I've seen a growth, a success maybe, of the role that coaching has played as it is moved from the UK, the US, France and Germany into many other parts of the world. Uh, yet at the same time, we've seen much of the research that we as academics are doing here has been very much concentrated in maybe weird samples. So we have focused on white, educated, industrialized, rich uh, and democratic societies. How do we start to, as researchers, begin to engage in other societies where the samples are different from these? Are the answers going to be the same? And as we think about that cross-cultural work, how do we begin to think about engaging in a way that doesn't simply assume that the McDonaldization of coaching, the model that we've created in our own experiences in the UK or in the US, uh, the hamburger version of coaching is equally delicious in Nigeria or in Korea uh, or in Indonesia. So how do we begin to think about amplifying African and Asian models of coaching? How do we begin to think about researching those uh, with samples that are different to those that we've used before? The third aspect that I wanted to move on and talk around oh, was around evidence-based approaches. And Eric talked uh, in a very articulate way, drawing on his research and talked extensively about the number of studies. Uh, and I guess I want to be provocative this evening and say, there is a danger that we sit here as a group of researchers and say, well, well done, Jonathan Passmore, or, or well done any of us for the fabulous work that we have done. Aren't we brilliant? We can almost pack up because we're almost understanding all of what we're doing. I think that we're still only in the foothills uh, in this three decades of maybe coaching research that's happened. And we have often been too much led by practice, too much focused on thinking about small sample sizes where the intervention is not clearly defined or described. And instead we need to be looking to other fields, maybe in terms of medicine, certainly in terms of therapy, where sample sizes are significantly larger. Uh, and randomized controls, if we're saying that there may be 200 of these, I would probably uh, put a case to say 100 plus, 150 plus, 170 plus of those are with sample sizes uh, or with methods that are not clearly described and that we could challenge those results as a uh, uh, because of the poor methods that have been used over the past, certainly two decades when those studies have been ongoing. And instead, I would see that instead we need to move to a model where we have much more collaboration. Instead of one researcher trying to work alone and get a sufficient sample size with maybe a student population where that population is very restricted and all the difficulties around that, I think a collaborative model where we need to be bringing together universities, professional bodies and large scale coaching providers and that we have sufficient funding for researchers in collaboration to do the large scale studies that we see carried out in health contexts. And in that way, we can gain a deeper understanding a more robust search that really pushes our domain from those foothills towards the mountains. And the final area that I wanna talk about is in relation uh, to something that certainly I hold dear, and I know a number of you, Peter, probably uh, uh, would hold this dear too, is around the role of supervision. And we've raised this question around, how do we help coaches, maybe in terms of their self-care, in terms of their well-being, in terms of their reflective practice? And supervision has been a much discussed area, but a very little researched area. So what do we need to be doing as a research community 
to really answer that question around whether supervision is a better method for reflection, enhances novice or experienced coaching practice. And if those are the cases, what are the methods of supervision that lead to those sorts of outcome, outcomes? So those are the five questions, five rocks that I wanted to throw into the pond this evening uh, and keep to 10 minutes, Richard, to enable you to be back on time for our discussion this evening.